In this lesson, we're going to look at objective 6.2, energy diagrams. So our learning objective states that we should be able to represent a chemical or physical transformation with an energy diagram. So when it comes to chemical or physical processes, they can be described through an energy diagram. And these energy diagrams talk about based off it being endothermic or exothermic and helping us understand energy and how much time has passed. So chemical processes usually occur because they are thermodynamically favorable. This is a word that we're gonna be using a lot here on out. Uh, if something is favorable, it will happen on its own. Now, not a lot of our reactions are favorable and we'll get into the more kinetic side of that, that's unit five, but a lot of our processes in general are favorable in the sense that you could just react the two together and the reaction's gonna happen. So mixing two things and it ends up happening, but not all reactions do that, but in most cases they will be favorable. So this means that high energy to low energy is when we're talking about thermodynamically favorable stuff. So this is generally from something that's less stable to more stable. So again, you can kind of see why if we had something that's stable and we want to go to less stable, the, the reaction would be considered unfavorable. Why would you want to go in the opposite direction? Okay. All right. So I have two graphs. One is exothermic on the left and on the right we have endothermic. So what I want us to write right here is A and B because I'm gonna label that graph and we'll talk about all the different pieces of it. Here A, when I label the graph, will reference bonds broken. So if we're talking about bonds broken in a reaction, and these bonds, please note, they could be intermolecular forces, they could be intramolecular forces, okay? Here, if we're breaking bonds, these are going to be our reactants, while B is going to be bonds formed. These will be our products. So I'm sure you can probably figure out where I'll be putting A and B, but this matters, and I know it's labeled as well, but here our reactants bonds are being broken. While reaction progress occurs, we'll get finally to our products. So I'm going to mention we're going to first talk about activation energy. You'll see that's denoted uh, on both of the graphs. Here, they like to say activation energy is capital E, subscript capital A. So activation energy is the energy needed to have the reaction proceed. And again, this is our activation energy. And generally, our activation energy is used to break bonds. And this, again, can be chemical, or it could be IMFs, those bonds that I was mentioning here for physical reactions. So if you don't have enough activation energy, the reaction will not proceed, all right? Uh, you will never need to calculate activation energy, please know there is an equation for that. It's called the Arrhenius equation. Once we uh, go back to unit five and talk about kinetics, I'll reference the Arrhenius equation, but you'll never need to calculate activation energy. Uh, so exothermic, uh, you can see uh, it's labeled energy is released right here. And then for endothermic, energy is absorbed right here. So you will notice energy absorbed, energy released, it's always going from A to B. It's taking the difference, okay? That's actually very, very, very important. So you will see below I have something called, uh, so I have something labeled equation. So that equation, if you want to know the enthalpy of the reaction, the energy, the change in energy, you take the energy for the products minus or the difference of the enthalpy of reactants. That change in energy tells us if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. And so here, the sign for delta H, if our delta H is negative, this is for exothermic because energy required, or activation energy, is less 
than energy released. So if you can actually see based off the graph on the left, activation energy is right here, and here is our delta H. I know it kind of looks the same here, uh, but most of our graphs, you'll see that that activation energy is less. They look about the same, but it's totally fine. But mostly you will see a more drastic change in the endothermic. So then if delta H is positive, this is for endothermic because energy required ends up being more than the energy absorbed. Sorry. So our delta H is positive. So going back to that graph, you can see that activation energy is a lot more than the energy absorbed. All right. And so also one thing I want to note for endothermic, you can see our reactant energy, potential energy right here. The reactant energy is much less than the products. All right. This is going to be referenced towards our uh, endothermic reactions. And this takes this into consideration. There's a reason we do product products minus reactants. The difference between that energy products minus reactants ends up getting us the endothermic, which makes sense. If this value right here is much higher than this one, you're going to get a more overall positive. But then when you look at reactants and products on the exothermic, reactants is much higher than our products. Well, if we take the difference between those two, your reactants is much higher. So you'll get an overall negative because of that. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I want to reference about this, but I do want to say we'll talk about more of these graphs with kinetics and it will start to click a little bit better. But there's a reason I do want to mention these graphs, just because when we're talking about energy, you got to know how much energy the reactants and products have, because this helps us mathematically figure out if it's endothermic or exothermic, okay? And when I was talking about favorable reactions, the exothermic reaction will be our more favorable reaction because you didn't need as much activation energy. And also because the products are lower oops, are lower in potential energy compared to our reactants. Here, favorable reaction because you don't need as much activation energy, but endothermic needs so much activation energy uh, to get to our products because our products were in a higher potential energy than our reactants. So endothermic pre uh, processes end up not being as favorable as our exothermic. All right, energy profiles. So these are for multiple steps, multiple step reactions, but I don't want you to worry too, too much about drawing it or referencing it. I just wanted to talk about it just in case it does show up. So if you look here, there's a lot of things going on with this. Here you have delta H lattice, delta H hydration, delta H solution, which we all talked about in 6.1. And you can see it also tells us the steps, step one and step two. So remembering from 6.1, delta H solution is gonna be the sum of the delta H lattice plus delta H hydration. So here for delta H lattice, this is step one on the graph, all right, which ends up being positive. So here, delta H lattice, positive because it's going up, okay? And then delta H hydration will be step two reference on that graph, and it's negative because it's going down. And then that leads us with the last one, delta H solution. That's going to be taking the different I guess the one ascends it is the difference because one ends up being negative, but it takes step one and step two. And overall, since the arrow is going up, this tells us that this delta H solution is overall positive. This would be endothermic overall. My guess is you'll only probably see it for these type of reactions. When we're talking about dissolving an ionic solid, you'll probably see that. All right. Lastly, I wanted to show this graph. This is another look at energy diagrams. This one doesn't show activation energy. So here, energy diagrams without 
EA, active, the activation energy, you don't technically see that. So you're kind of missing the big jumps, okay? Here you can see these are reactants to products. It's still reading it left to right, reactants to products. And it, show, it actually just, like I said, without activation energy, it shows us our delta H. So it takes the reactants and the products, because remember, delta H reaction is products minus reactants. They take the difference of products and reactants to get our overall. So here, this is what an exothermic would look like. Our reactant should be higher in energy compared to products. And then the one on the right is an overall positive because our reactants are lower than our products. And again, we are just, these are energy diagrams without that activation energy. It's mostly locking in on looking at delta H. All right, moving on, I have an example problem right here. I kind of want you guys to try this out yourself. I want you to reference that first energy diagram we did at the beginning of the notes. I want you to draw, and again, it doesn't necessarily matter uh, how you're drawing it, how big your hump is uh, for the activation energy, whatever. Here, I do want you to label activation energy. Make sure you have products and reactants in the right uh, areas and making sure looking at your delta H overall is this endothermic exothermic and when you label reactants and products I want you to actually put the reactants and products based off that chemical reaction so if you can pause the video try this out yourself and then click play and I'll go over the answers All right so let's go over this example here this is an exothermic graph because of the delta H it's negative 1196 so I made sure to show that the reactants were higher than the products. I labeled the reactants and products in their uh, correct spots. And then I showed the, the areas of activation energy and the area for delta H. And I, I purposely made sure that my delta H was much larger than the activation energy. So this would be a perfect example of what sometimes a free response could look like. You don't have to label all the parts, but they would be looking to make sure you had the reactants higher than the products if you needed to draw an exothermic reaction like this. 